Assalamu alaikum wa rahmat wa barakat. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, my name is Robert Kirkpatrick. I direct the Global Pulse Initiative in the Secretary General's office at the UN. So, our talk today is entitled Big Data for Sustainable Development. What does it take to get to the next level? Um, why are we here? I want to talk a little bit about why we're having this conversation here today um, about getting to the next level. I think all of you can probably feel it in the sessions, in the corridors, in your day jobs these days. There is a global movement underway. It is gathering momentum. We share a vision of a future in which useful, actionable, real-time insights from big data and a world of ambient algorithms are generated in ways that are privacy protecting and made available to all of the different users and beneficiaries of the data around the world to inform better measurement of SDG progress, better implementation of, of programs, a better response to humanitarian emergencies. Um, this is where we're going. But the world has changed so much since the beginning of this millennium. If you'll remember the simpler world of the Millennium Development Goals in the first 15 years, um, most of the data needed to achieve those goals was data that was collected and owned and used by public sector institutions. Today, we believe most of the data needed to achieve the 2030 Agenda is produced in real time by people, often without their knowledge. It is collected by machines. It is owned by corporations, and yet it is still needed by public sector to implement the 2030 Agenda. That's a very fragmented landscape in which to proceed. Um, part of the challenge is that I think a number of us who've been involved in this space for a while, um, in the early days, starry-eyed and ambitious, we honestly thought we would be further along by now. The data revolution has been a bit delayed compared to what most of us had expected. And today we wanted to to talk through some of the reasons why this is happening, um, what some of the most exciting opportunities are, uh, understand where we are today uh, with some case studies, and talk about what it's going to take to move things forward at an accelerated pace. Um, but today we see some, I mean, there are some challenges, there's no question, and we'll hear about these today. Um, businesses who control the data see reputational risk related to privacy of their customers, regulatory risk in terms of what's uh, the transparency that they have with government, competitive risk in terms of what their, you know, the competition in their markets could do with the data. In the, govern in the government side of things, of course, you have issues related to capacity um, and, and the need to change regulations, and we'll talk about that. We need greater investment in science and technology in this area. Um, this is an in, th these new forms of data are empirical evidence of human behavior in many cases. They are creating a new substrate, a new foundation for entirely new sub uh, social sciences that will transform global development practice, uh, that will transform how we respond to emergencies. Um, but we need to be investing more in the science and the technology to make sense of that data. And finally, I don't need to point to the news cycle, I suppose, to indicate we need to change the balance of public trust. Public trust around data and algorithms has been badly broken. A lot of things are going to be, have to change for us to be able to move this forward and get to scale. So today, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start with two presentations um, that will give you a sense of real-world work that our Global Pulse team is doing with our partners um, in Indonesia and Uganda. Um, we'll have uh, presentations from our head of office there in, uh, in Jakarta and from our data science officer 
in Uganda. Uh, we'll then go into a panel discussion that will talk through some of the challenges and opportunities in this space and, and uh, what's holding them back um, before wrapping up. Um, so let me I'll just give you very briefly an overview of uh, what the Global Pulse Initiative is um, before uh, diving into the presentations. So Global Pulse is, a, is based in the Secretary General's Office of the United Nations. We're working to get to a world in which big data is used responsibly for the public good. Um, we're seeing evidence of the future possibility of that happening, but it's not happening yet at scale. Um, and our mission is really to act as an accelerator around discovery, development, and adoption of both uh, the solutions needed to do that from a technical standpoint, but also the enabling policy frameworks to make it possible. We operate three labs in New York, Kampala, Uganda, and Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, where we work with pa partners in private sector, academia, uh, the United Nations government, um, to test out new solutions and policy approaches. You can see the, yeah, the space we have, the spaces we, we, we work in are pretty classic innovation labs. We're about 75 people altogether, a mixture of data scientists and AI engineers, uh, designers, visualization experts, uh, but also privacy and ethics experts, partnership experts, um, experts in advocacy. Um, so it's a mix of traditional and non-traditional skills. Um, our sort of founding hypothesis at Global Pulse is this idea of digital services as sensor networks for human well-being. Um, you can tell the idea is sort of being able to measure human well-being in real time and using that information to predict uh, the health and safety of different populations when it comes to poverty and employment and food security and, um, and public health. So as we see people using all of these services out there from mobile devices to financial services to sharing in social media, uh, when their needs change, when they lose their jobs, when they get sick, when they struggle to afford basic necessities, they change how they use the services in ways that produce patterns we can learn to recognize. Um, here you see a map of Jakarta produced by people tweeting. One of the reasons that we have a, a lab in Jakarta is because this city, by some reckonings, produces nine million tweets a day. Um, we have a global partnership with Twitter that gives us pro bono access to all 500 million messages a day out of the Twitter firehose. And we use that data to do various projects around the world. Um, once you filter out people talking about celebrities and sports scores and new products, you find people talking about the affordability of basic necessities and reports of floods. There's a lot of signal out there. Here you see an, um, a visualization that was produced by our partner BBVA Bank, Bank of Mer. Um, this is back in 2011. Um, visualizing spending patterns uh, over an Easter weekend. Um, and it's interesting because every financial institution in the world can see how much money people have to spend on food versus fuel versus clothing, um, where they choose to spend it, and how changes in fuel prices, changes in uh, rainfall levels affect spending. Yet this data is not being used systematically to inform policy or crisis response, and that's a problem. Here you see a visualization um, of mobility patterns from mobile devices. Um, this is from Tokyo. Some of you may recognize this date. Um, so you have GPS-enabled smartphones, and what happens is, of course, the earthquake that caused the Fukushima crisis. And watch carefully what happens. Right? The public transportation system stops working. Right? Um, tsunami is a Japanese word, and what you see is people beginning to move away from the waterfront knowing that this is a risk. Right? If you can see how people move in real time just by running a mobile phone network, you can see how they are displaced by a natural disaster, how their movements might be spreading infectious diseases. Ask questions like, why are women in this particular slum area going all the way over here from prenatal care when there are clinics nearby or modeling exposure to atmospheric pollution as people move through cities? This data has tremendous power to transform how we implement our programs, and yet, by and large, it's not being used for the public good. This is pretty game-changing stuff. I mean, we, we often talk about the difference between the traditional sort of approach to development, which is linear and based on snapshots uh, through surveys, moving from something like photography to something more like video, the ability to continuously observe change and dynamics. 
Just as photography has not replaced video, we don't expect that surveys are going obsolete. Surveys, of course, allow you to understand causality in ways that much of the big data analysis does not. But big data can tell you when what you expected to happen is not happening so that you can find out very quickly why. The kinds of data that we work with at Global Pulse fall roughly into two categories, um, what people say and what people do. You can think of the former as sort of like open data. Uh, much of it is publicly available. Um, it is shared with consent, so the privacy issues are reduced here, though they are not zero. Um, and this stuff doesn't fit in your spreadsheets, of course. Um, but there's a lot of it out there, and we work with many of these data sets. The other types of data sets that we work with um, our behavioral uh, information. And we work with, three in, uh, again, through partnerships with private sector um, to get access to things like search data, web traffic, mobile communications, financial transactions, all of it anonymized to protect privacy. Um, this kind of data is incredibly powerful for revealing in real time what's happening in society and whether our programs are working, uh, what the needs of a population are. Um, but they're guarded very closely by private sector because they have high business value from a competitive standpoint, and they have to be protected from a privacy standpoint to prevent harm. So there's a sense in which all of this data out there, and it's passing through our bodies right now on the mobile airwaves, all of this data is kind of like a new natural resource. It's increasingly ubiquitous. Um, it's infinitely renewable. You can't use it up. But some would argue it has fallen into the hands of an opaque and unregulated extractive industry. Its benefits are not reaching those who could most benefit from them. The, the skills needed to unlock the insights from this data are incredibly expensive, whether we're talking about data scientists or, or uh, you know, very large uh, data processing centers. Um, and in some ways, this data shares an affinity this is a natural resource similar to nuclear energy, right? In its raw form, like uranium, this stuff comes mixed with your personal information. Unshielded, it is dangerous to human beings. It tends to leak and contaminate and harm. So we as a society are at a moment not unlike the 1950s after seeing the horrors of nuclear war, when we have to ask, what can we do to um, contain this stuff safely, to understand how to mitigate its risks through new kinds of science, um, and to safely unlock its potential to power our journey to 2030. A lot of this work is, is based on a, this concept we call data philanthropy, which is engaging with partners in industry, a mobile industry, financial services, um, many different industries, and saying, let's find a way for you to share some of the data that powers your business in a way that protects privacy, and in a way that protect, protects competitiveness, but still lets us use the data for public good. A um, couple of examples of the projects we do with this data, just to give you a flavor for it. Um, what we're doing here is working with data from Twitter. Um, oops, let's go back. What we're doing from here is, wor here is working with data from Twitter, um, essentially mapping xenophobic speech against refugees and about refugees. Um, as they pass along different routes through Europe. This was done for uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, and it's, it's interesting because you can draw a line on the map and it will search along that route. Uh, and we're automatically extracting xenophobic speech and classifying it into things like reports of abuse, uh, detention, um, where people are claiming asylum, problems with paperwork, crossing borders, and so forth. You can see this in real time. Um, this is work we did in Indonesia, uh, developing a price index based on tweets. Um, as long as the prices are rising or stay high, people complain a lot online about what they're having to pay for different commodities. And we get very, very strong predictions uh, of the actual food prices on the ground just by looking at what you can see in Twitter. We call this uh, complainonomics or wingelytics. Um, there's a lot of signal out there. Uh, we've been working. Um, with uh, analysis of satellite imagery, for example, looking at refugee camps, um, to be able to understand uh, the growth of refugee camps as well as informal settlements um, in places like northern Uganda. Uh, we can use satellite imagery along with convolutional neural network algorithms, so-called deep learning, um, to be able to make sense of this and count the number of structures as they grow. 
Um, it's challenging work because the backgrounds are different. You're training software to pick out the edges of structures against a background, but are we talking about sand or clay or grass? Um, it takes a lot of training of these algorithms. But you can see an example here um, where iteratively the algorithms are able to identify virtually all of the structures. We're working to get to the point that we can uh, do an equivalent of a, of a human analyst. We're over 97% accurate at this point. Here is work that we did um, uh, with BBVA uh, Bank. And uh, this work um, uh, essentially looked at um, uh, the impact of a hurricane, um, and in this case, uh, hitting the coast of Mexico. Um, so what we looked at is essentially, oops, sorry. Uh, what we looked at here is basically what is the impact of uh, a natural disaster on spending. Um, when you look at the, uh, for example, the drop in debit card transactions and then how long it takes different communities to recover, you can see this, and you can see it for women versus men, rich versus poor, young versus old. Um, here is an example of work we've been doing uh, that is using mobility information uh, from anonymized mobile phone network data to predict the spread of Zika in Colombia. You combine the mobility of the population with locations of current outbreaks, rainfall, and mosquito larval counts. You can get a pretty, idea what, pretty good idea what parts of the country the highest risk of an outbreak are in. Here we see estimates of food consumption and poverty. Um, by looking at mobile phone data. So how people spend money on food, for example, in Rwanda, is very closely tracked by how much money they're spending on their mobile phone uh, services every week. It's like every mobile phone operator in the world is running a food security monitoring network without knowing it. We've seen that you can actually get very robust proxies of the multidimensional poverty index by looking at airtime spending, for example, in Uganda. Here is work that we've been doing with AIS marine traffic data. So this is the movement of ships, for example, in the Mediterranean, um, as well as the distress beacons that are set off by refugee boats attempting to cross from places like Libya. Um, and uh, what you see here is interesting, right? We've been able to train a deep learning algorithm to recognize rescue events. So you can see when a commercial vessel pursuing its normal route suddenly slows down and circles back and begins to zigzag. That's a pattern you can train an algorithm to recognize. The idea here, again, working with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, is to be able to identify where ships full of hungry, thirsty people um, are likely to come into port within the next few days. So there are lots of opportunities out there. And I think people today are increasingly aware and are being reminded of the fact that data misuse may be harmful. There have been examples uh, from research using Facebook data, for example, that showed everything from your IQ to your political affiliations to your degree of religiosity um, to your sexual orientation can be predicted uh, from Facebook. In fact, this group of uh, researchers at Stanford uh, last year developed an algorithm that with any five pictures of a man's face can predict his sexual orientation with 95% accuracy. Some might argue that's a weaponized algorithm. Right? Misuse of, the, of data can be profoundly harmful. Um, we've been working in the UN on, um, as the Deputy Secretary General had noted earlier, uh, on uh, privacy policies and ethical frameworks um, around the use of this data and guidelines on how to work with it safely. Um, this is uh, work that continues to advance, but we already have instruments that have been adopted across the UN system as a starting framework. Um, but to conclude here, I think, you know, if you take that example from Colombia where you can use uh, the location of, in people's movement to predict a disease outbreak, there's a problem here that isn't being recognized. The misuse of information is, is seen as, as, you know, a recognized problem, but the misuse of this data is quite significant. For decades, right, people have been producing data without their knowledge that could have been used for better service delivery, better early warning systems, better crisis response, and more accountability. If we want to take location information and we want to know exactly where people are, we can build an epidemiologic model that will tell you there's an outbreak right in that red spot, and you can put a quarantine zone around it. But if you know exactly where people are, that's a privacy risk. So we aggregate the data to protect privacy. 
And pretty soon, privacy is very, very safe, and yet it's, there's no hope of containing the outbreak anymore because the area of uncertainty is too wide. So we'll talk about this more later today, but I knew you, you, this is a theme that will come up in these discussions. Um, we need to work through a new approach to thinking about the relationship between all of these different risks, the risk of misuse and the risk of misuse. So with that, um, I'd like to, uh, yeah, I'll just I'll wrap up by noting this. I mean, I think the, the future we're trying to get to is one in which uh, ultimately this is like the socioeconomic equivalent of meteorology, um, that we can uh, eventually, just as you can see, wind speed and temperature and air pressure today anywhere in the world through a public-private data commons. One day, we'll be able to understand what's happening anywhere in the world on any SDG or the response to any crisis through a public-private real-time data commons that's a, based on partnerships with the private sector. We know this is possible. We can feel it coming, but we're impatient. The, 20, the year 2030 is approaching, and we need to up our game. Um, with that, I, I'd like to call to the uh, podium um, our head of office for Pulse Lab Jakarta, uh, Mrs. Dervil Usher, um, who will talk about some of the work that her team is doing there. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Robert. And also, thank you to the organizers for my step, um, so you can all see me. Um, so today, I was asked to speak about uh, how we scale big data for development and sus sustainable development. And so what I will do over the next few minutes is, is share a couple of examples um, of how we build scalable, scalable models for governments across the Asia-Pacific region, and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. <coughs> So let's start with Indonesia, which is where I'm based. Indonesia is blessed to have the third largest area of tropical forest in the world. And these forests play a significant role in uh, climate change mitigation. Unfortunately, though, on, Indonesia is also hampered by uh, forest fires, which are primarily human made. And these result in meters of burning peat in swamp forests, which produces more smoke and carbon emissions than do ordinary forest fires. The drought that was experienced in Indonesia in 2014-2015, which was brought on by El Nino, exacerbated the haze conditions. And the result was extensive environmental damage, health problems, school closures, work disruption, and canceled transportation services. So a pattern is emerging here that local haze thus becomes a subnational disaster which typically takes less than 24 hours to become a national disaster. National haze disasters ignore international boundaries and can quickly become a regional disaster. And so when burning peat becomes fire, and this leads to a haze disaster, the main questions for the national and local governments are, what exactly is happening and what can we do? Pulse Lab Jakarta was already operating in Indonesia and we're set up as a joint initiative with the United Nations and the government of Indonesia. We'd already produced a prototype of the dashboard that you see here on your screen, which was designed to provide more integrated data and innovation, uh, information and enhanced data visualization by complementing traditional data sources that were already being used by the government of Indonesia, such as satellite and meteorological data with relevant social media and other digital data sources. Hayesgazer worked because suddenly national government was getting very quick feedback from the citizens whose lives were being affected by the haze. Citizens were getting engaged, and between that and Hayes ignoring national boundaries, this suddenly became a political issue. And we had the attention of the national government who saw Hayesgazer as a platform that could monitor the effects of haze on citizens, as well as the response from local government. This, this citizen feedback mechanism provided by Hayesgazer allows the national government to understand what was actually happening and where. And the Hayesgazer platform has been installed in the President of Indonesia's Situation Room and is being used as a monitoring tool for provincial governments around, the, for monitoring of provincial, uh, provincial and subnational governments uh, around the country. So this was a great success for the lab. But we then started to get asked for solutions to different problems around the region. 
So we repurposed Hayes Gazer platform and we produced a cyclone monitoring system which um, for the South Pacific countries such as Fiji, Tonga, Samoa and other countries across the South Pacific have been beset with very strong and damaging cyclones in recent years and the government has had problems with identifying where to direct the response efforts post cyclone. One common solution was to trawl through open social media posts to understand damaged areas or rule out certain areas where the cyclone may not have hit so badly. Cyclone 1 acts much like Haze Gazer in that it's ingesting open data sets and social media posts and displaying them in a way that makes it easier for decision making. Public sector officials can now turn to this platform and better understand how citizens are preparing before a disaster, managing during the event, and understanding how they're managing post, uh, the post-disaster recovery process. In turn, that allows the government to understand where they should direct their resources. So I think this is a really good example of how a scaled project in one country, albeit, let's be fair here, it took several years for us to do Haze Gazer. We had a champion within the government. We had a disaster which turned political, but still we've got a scalable solution which can be adapted in a lot, a lot less time for, for another country. Which brings me to the lessons that we've learned from this whole process. We need to identify champions within the public sector who can collaborate in the process. This makes adoption much, much easier. We need to design with the user in mind. There's no point in building a snazzy dashboard if no one is going to use it. Funding, it's the perennial problem really, isn't it? Pulse Lab Jakarta has actually been very fortunate to have a flexible um, core funding stream from the beginning, which has allowed us to be agile and meet the needs of national and subnational levels of government. And we're very grateful to the governments of Indonesia and Australia for their support. But I believe that we're probably one of the exceptions. We need more funding dedicated to help scale up the many amazing prototypes that are out there. Which brings me to the next point, which is regulatory frameworks. This area is still quite new, and policymakers don't have the regulatory frameworks to rely on, which makes adoption and scaling up very, very difficult. And while it's not always possible, where you can, try to find the sustainable home for your prototype. Try and have a partner from the start of the process so that the scaling up model can be discussed as you move along the stage. With Cyclamon, we're talking with the South Pacific community to see how we can hand over that platform so that they can actually scale it out to the countries in which they operate. And we find that that's going to be the sustainable home. With that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Derval. Um, Martin, the floor is yours. Martin is our data scientist in Kampala. Let's talk about some of the work they're doing there. Uh, good afternoon. Allow me to take you to Africa. So um, I'll be talking about uh, scaling up big data projects uh, for the SDGs. I'll discuss two projects that we have done with partners. Then I'll talk about uh, some barriers and then I'll give some kind of recommendations. The first application I would like to talk about Uh, sorry, uh, the first application I want to talk about is um, an application developed with artificial intelligence that transforms people's voices in public discussions on radio into insights for the SDGs. So in Uganda, ordinary citizens, especially those in rural areas, normally phone into radio stations to air out their needs, views, and concerns. And it is estimated that 7.5 million words are spoken on radio every day. Now, this number of words is equivalent to those in the complete works of William Shakespeare. These anonymous millions and millions of words 
basically big data can be harnessed to improve people's lives. So in the lab in Kampala, we have come up with a radio content analysis tool together with our partners that makes this possible. And it does this at large scale and in real time. The lab started uh, working in Uganda with Acholi and Luganda, which are local languages in Uganda. And then we have also done some work in Somalia with the Somali language. So how does the application work? The application performs transcriptions from audio to text, and this is followed by uh, data mining. The insights from public discussions on radio have been used by government counterparts and also development partners to plan and manage a variety of interventions. For example, the Ministry of Health in Uganda has used the application to get feedback from citizens on the quality of health service delivery. And also, they can also pick early warning signals on disease outbreaks. The second example that I would want to share with you is, is using uh, satellite imagery. Um, Robert has already showed you some examples, and this is uh, another example. So what you can see is Kampala in 2002, July. And this is Kampala in July 2018. So after 16 years, you can see the change of urbanization. Sorry. You can see the change of urbanization, and this urbanization is not, is not uniform. So if you zoomed into a particular area, you would see that um, you know, some areas are expanding, and others, there is increase in the density, especially in the, in the slums. So we are doing this work uh, with the Uganda Bureau of Statistics uh, in Uganda because we think it's good to work with them throughout the whole process uh, such that they can also learn from this and be able to implement this in other areas. And we believe um, for slum areas, this would be useful for planning uh, for basic infrastructure like drainage, power, water supply, and disposal of solid waste. Um, so what, do we, what are we doing exactly in this uh, example? So this is just showing the built-up area. Uh, but in, um, in this example for slums, we detect the roof areas in slums and we are able to determine the density and also the extent of these uh, slums. And as I said, this is good to support infrastructure uh, planning. And we know that um, in other parts of Africa, they are in the same situation, so this kind of tool can also deplo be deployed uh, for adoption in other countries uh, to support uh, planning. So these examples are quite interesting, but as Robert has said, and um, uh, there is a problem of legal frameworks, so data privacy and data protection, and there needs to be, uh, needs to, to, we need basically, uh, governments uh, need to have uh, responsible legislation on data privacy and data protection uh, that can support the legitimate use of big data. Then also there's a problem of championship and um, ownership. So there is always fear of change. Sometimes it's lack of awareness of what big data can do. Sometimes it's low data use culture uh, that needs to improve if uh, ownership and championship are to improve. Then also the other problem is funding. And in this, 
the funding levels for such uh, big data projects are very low compared to uh, other funding for international assistance. So to overcome these barriers, we are working with countries in Africa to strengthen legal, uh, uh, legal frameworks so that um, we can facilitate the scaling up of such projects. And we are also engaging private sector and partners to ensure ownership and local leadership to drive the use of scaled up big data applications. Now, I would like to end here by saying that big data is central to the achievement of the SDGs. And I want to echo the words of Peter Drucker. If we cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So for the next uh, section now, we're going to move to the panel discussion. Uh, to kick that off, I'm going to ask our moderator, uh, Ms. Paula Hidalgo-Sanchez, who's the manager of uh, Pulse Lab Kampala, um, to start the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So it is my pleasure to introduce first the panelists. Um, what does it take to take to the next level the use of big data for sustainable development? In my humble opinion, championship is key. So we have three champions here with us. So I'm going to start introducing Heather Savary, who works at the UK Office for National Statistics as Deputy National Statistician and Director for Data Capability. She's driving the transformation of data services to expand the use of data to inform evidence-based policy in the UK. Heather is also the co-chair of the Big Data UN Global Working Group for Official Statistics. Thank you, Heather, for being with us. Yeah. We're going to introduce next Janine Boss, who works as head of the SDG Accelerator of the GSMA. The GSMA represents plus 1,000 companies in the mobile communications industry worldwide. Janine is leading global initiatives that accelerate the mobile industry's impact to achieve the SDGs. And the third panelist, Elena Alfaro, who works as the global head of data and open innovation in BBVA Group. This department is leading the generation of machine learning algorithms for BBVA digital products. Elena is championing the transformation of the company into a data-driven organization. Our panelists have very strong background in years of work inspiring, I would say, in the scaling up of big data for, for sustainable development. So we're going to ask them now to just give us some highlights of these years of work. So we'll start with Elena. OK, uh, hello. OK, so thank you so much, uh, Robert and, and Paula, for the invitation. It's a huge pleasure and an honor to, to be here with you. Uh, so I will take my three minutes to explain what we do. Uh, I had some slides, maybe if they can go on. Uh, so I, I'll explain you what's BBVA. Uh, so BBVA is a bank. It's, very, it's a big bank uh, based in Spain, originally based in Spain, but um, we have operations in more than, well, 30-something countries with big uh, retail presence in uh, 10 countries, especially Spain, Latin America, Turkey, and, and Mexico. Uh, and in, within BBVA, I lead a group of data scientists that work uh, directly for the business problems. And uh, we have dedicated over the past, I would say, since mm, 2012, some of our time trying to, you know, find out if the data uh, generated by financial activity can really tell us things to better understand society and to help society to do or to make better decision making. So I will take uh, just very briefly to explain you uh, why we think that financial data can be crucial, uh, uh, although it's not always present uh, in all the countries that we would like to, uh, okay? Because, uh, of, of course, uh, economic transactions and payments are more uh, active in richer countries, but I think still we can do uh, a lot of stuff. So, uh, just to give you a couple of examples, this, is, uh, this data source is high resolution, uh, and, and it's, it's also very big hike in sample, in the case of Mexico, in, in our, in our uh, own case, so more or less we are talking about uh, one uh, 
1.5 billion transactions every year, uh, generated by more, more than 20 million uh, cardholders. So this is only one year. So if you compare this with a survey on how you spend your money, this is, as Robert said, huge. Uh, and this happens since around 1 million uh, points of sale terminals. Okay, so this uh, data source has uh, a lot of characteristics. Some of them is that it reflects facts. So it's not reflecting any intention. We like to compare it with, uh, with other, of course, of course, complementary data sources. Like for instance, when you say like, that's okay, but that's an intention. When you buy, that's a fact. Okay, so, uh, and it's also very highly descriptive because uh, using it, of course, in an anonymized way, we can talk about age, I mean, very exact uh, age of the customers, gender, how do they buy, where do they buy, where do they repeat, how do they transport from their houses to the shops to pay, because we know where they live and we know where they pay. So uh, it's very, very descriptive and we think it's, it's uh, you know, very useful, of course, in complement with uh, other data sources. Some of the examples of things that can be done with, uh, with this data, this is, uh, again, payments data. Uh, for instance, you can, it's very good to describe what happens in the territory from a commercial perspective but also from a social perspective because at the end of the day, the retail is like the heart of, of many cities. No? So in this case, uh, we can talk about behavioral consumption patterns. We can talk about events impact and events in a broad sense. So it could be, for instance, from a, a work in an infrastructure. How is that affecting the neighborhood uh, and also how people spend in that neighborhood? Uh, I don't know, a change in the legal framework. For instance, we analyzed in, in the case of Spain when the government decided to change the uh, retail uh, uh, schedules, opening times. How does that impact the neighborhood and the cities? Uh, this, of, all, all these examples, by the way, I, are open. They are published, so you can search easily. Uh, in this case, we did uh, also an analysis on how, what uh, payments data tell us about cities and how cities are used. We did it for the case of Madrid, Barcelona, and then uh, Mexico. Uh, so you can, you can search that, this is, uh, I think, interesting. Also tourism is very interesting to see tourism through the lenses of payments data. Uh, and of course events, and in this case, as, as uh, was mentioned by, by Robert, we, we did a collaboration with uh, Global Pulse how, on, on measuring events, in this case negative events, like uh, the impact of a disaster. This we did for Baja California, Mexico. So the interesting thing here, as you see there, is that you can see normality when people go every day and buy stuff. And then you see when the hurricane hit the coast, you see a huge drop in, in, uh, in, the, in the how people spend. And then the interesting thing is the recovery time. So we were trying to measure the resilience of the different areas uh, to uh, a disaster. So in the case, for instance, of San Jose del Cabo, the recovery rate was really slow compared to other areas in the, in the surroundings. So the question was, why are they doing worse than the rest? So this is like a, hmm. an intro on our work. Thank, Thank you, you, Elena. We're going to ask now, I'm going to ask Heather to share with us uh, some examples of the work that the government of the UK is doing with the big data for sustainable development and also for the UN uh, working group on, on big data for official Thank statistics. Okay, did I get my slide? Yes. Green? Oh, no, I've gone too far. It's slow. There we are. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for in including me in this panel. I'm a great big fan of the work that Global Pulse does. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick, very quick overview of some of the things that we're doing at the Office for National Statistics in the United Kingdom, where we have built a data science campus. So we're really looking very closely at the new tools and techniques which are available to actually understand the economy and society better. And on this uh, slide, there are four pictures. Um, the one at the top is our obligatory unicorn because we actually employ some wonderful unicorns um, and also the robots are because we do outreach into the community we teach schools how to do programming but the two examples I want to cover with you are at the bottom of the slide the one in the middle is our urban vegetation index and what we've done here is we're trying to show how you can exploit big data but there's more to it than just doing this for the United Kingdom so this is a technique that we've developed which takes standard openly available views from Google Street Map and basically as you fly down the street it identifies the amount of vegetation in any city, in any street, anywhere in the whole world that you can get an image. And it's not just Google Images, it's any standard image you can use this and apply this technology, this algorithm. But what we're trying to do here is we want to actually share this. So as, the work, as part of the work I do 
chairing the um, global, the big data Glo United Nations global platform is that we believe in terms of scaling up, which is what we're talking about on this panel, that the way that we need to scale up is, yes, of course, we do need to address the regulatory issues. We do need to look at funding. We do need to look about, at privacy and ethics, the way that we're all using public data. But the key thing is that many of the examples that you see around you, which are very innovative at the moment, there's quite a lot of replication. This conference is full of people who are doing very good work, but it's all very similar. If we really want to transform the use of data in the public interest, we need to collaborate better, and we need to collaborate across the whole of the United Nations. This is the ethos behind the global platform. So the algorithms and techniques that you'll see here are published and openly available for anyone to use. And I'll come on to the global platform in a minute, because I want to quickly cover the second example. This is um, around SDG 9.1.1, and this is work that we've done, again, using data science techniques to map um, access to an all-season road. We've done this, this is a part of the United Kingdom that you're seeing in front of you, and we've done this by combining census data with our own national mapping data. Again, if we want to scale this up for um, global reporting, we need to make sure that we are identifying and agreeing on techniques which we can share. The SDGs cannot be developed independently by each nation of the world. We need to come up with techniques to really scale so that we can genuinely say that we are comparing apples with apples and not apples with oranges. So quickly, because we don't have a lot of time, um, a little bit about the global platform. We had an open day yesterday on the global platform. You can visit us in the exhibition area and we've moved this now from the proof of concept stage to an alpha stage. And what it offers is four services. We're offering trusted methods, trusted data, trusted partners, partners and trusted learning. And this is about collaborations across the world. It's between statistical offices, data providers, and the private sector. Um, in our first offering on the platform, we've actually um, can provide access immediately to um, ADS data, that's aircraft data, AIS data, which I know Global Pulse also use, and also a Landsat satellite data. And we are talking to various commercial data providers as well, including, including a, a startup called Planet and also Airbus in the United Kingdom. So just to um, reaffirm my belief is that the way that we scale is to collaborate, and that means collaborating between statistical offices, between data providers and between the technology suppliers. We have tools and techniques, but we are at the leading edge of, a, if you like, the cusp of what we can do if we, if we come together to make the best of the data revolution in the public interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Janine, uh, the GSMA has already made significant progress in its Big Data for Social Good initiative. Tell us about this experience. Share with us some highlights about that. Thank you, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really a pleasure to be here. Uh, so yes, the GSMA is the Global Association for the Mobile Phone Industry, and our industry purpose is really to connect everyone to a better future. And as part of this, uh, we were the first industry as a whole to commit to the SDGs uh, when they were published in 2016. And under this umbrella, we set up a new initiative in 2017, uh, about a, a bit over a year ago, uh, around big data for social good. And when I talk about big data in the context of the mobile industry, what we mean is the data that's generated by mobile networks uh, in operating uh, and providing services to their customers. When this data is aggregated and anonymized to ensure consumers' privacy is respected and protected, when it is layered with other data sets, contextual data sets, uh, and then uh, added with uh, intelligent uh, analytical models and machine learning uh, and algorithms, unique insights can be delivered to governments and agencies to help infectious disease, to help uh, in the case of disasters, to help address environmental challenges. And the reason why the GSMA set up this initiative is that on the one hand, we'd seen great examples of this already around the world. 
For example, uh, in Nepal, mobile big data was used to help better understand where to direct emergency resources during uh, the aftermath of the earthquake. Uh, we've seen an example in Namibia where mobile data was used to help inform the government's strategy to eliminate um, uh, malaria. Um, or also in Pakistan, uh, mobile big data was leveraged to see how we could better predict the appearance of dengue uh, fever uh, and to be able to more quickly respond and react to that. So we've seen this real potential, but at the same time, uh, we haven't really seen scale. And so that's the reason why we set up this initiative uh, to see how through collaboration with our members, with our partners, with UN agencies and governments, how could we move from pilots, great research projects, great innovations, to actually deploying mobile big data at scale. Um, now, that's not an easy task, hence this panel today. Uh, it requires us to tackle very challenging questions. For example, what are the real insights that governments need? What decisions do they want to make? What problems are governments facing that can be addressed with mobile big data? It requires thinking about how to build trust in these services. It requires thinking around how to ensure investment in sustainable business models. Well, what are the common approaches that can be implemented? How do you replicate this at a global level? How do you ensure a policy environment that ensures these services can reach the market? So our approach has been to first set up an advisory panel of UN agencies and partners and a task force of 20 operators from around the world to really think through these key building blocks to scale. Uh, whether that's thinking about uh, the technical aspects. Uh, another key as consideration was we set from the outset a clear code of conduct as to uh, how um, operators can protect and respect consumer data uh, and also ethical considerations that should be adopted. Or today we released a paper around sustainable business models. Uh, what's the role that sustainable business models play in unlocking this space? So together we try to think through, uh, based on lessons learned, based on everyone's experiences, what are some of the steps that we can take, what are some of the common approaches we can develop, or some of the tools that could be useful to accelerate this space. And then the second layer is we also then learn by doing. We implement together with partners and operators different country projects and captures lessons learned from that and, and try out uh, what is working uh, from real first-hand experiences. Uh, we launched the first series of initiatives last year, more focused on health. Uh, we worked with Airtel and the WHO ITUB Health Through Mobile program in India. Uh, which is facing a major challenge around tuberculosis. And so leveraging mobile big data, we try to understand uh, could we help um, provide insights for the government that they could use to better manage the number of undiagnosed cases in the country or uh, increase adherence to treatment. So leveraging mobile big data, we were able to provide insights into the daily journeys uh, the recurring the patterns um, of movement by people and their relationship to TB incidents. Or uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, Telefonica developed a solution leveraging mobile big data as uh, a way to predict air pollution levels in the city up to 24 to 48 hours in advance so that the local municipality can take actions and take steps uh, to prevent uh, issues from occurring. Um, we also worked with Telenor and Harvard in Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Thailand uh, to address the question of the spread of multidrug resistant malaria uh, across the region. This year we launched a new range of initiatives, more around disaster preparedness, and we kicked off work uh, in Japan with the three mobile operators working with the cabinet office to understand how could mobile data be used to act, help predict um, or alert when abnormal movements are occurring and where people are aggregating during an earthquake. And we're working also with Tele Telefonica uh, and UNFAL in Latin America to understand the impact of climate change on, on migration patterns. So we keep um, learning and iterating through both this approach of working with the global group, global groups to understand what are some of the best practices as well as then learning by doing on the ground to move this forward and to capture lessons learned through tangible 
projects. All of this we've published online, and also we have a demo uh, space here at, uh, at the event, so do go and have a look uh, at some of the visualizations and interactive demos that we have set up there. Thank you for that, uh, Janine. And I will to continue now opening up to the conversation to ask you, what are the challenges that you're facing in persuading more operators to join the Big Data for Social Good initiative? What are the real challenges that you're facing? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think uh, it all relates back to that fundamental issue of how do we move from pilots to scale? And what are the things that we need to realize in the market? What are the steps that the industry or other partners need to take to get there? And so, um, you know, one of those aspects is uh, market demand and awareness of these solutions. We've seen great leadership by UN Global Pulse, by UN agencies, by some governments to really look at how mobile big data could be leveraged for decision making. But the reality is that this is not yet adopted, used by many governments around the world. We don't see awareness of the potential yet throughout all governments around the world of what mobile big data can mean. And so that's something that uh, through more awareness raising, more showcasing the art of the possible, maybe we could help so you uh, mean unlock. Uh, awareness of potential by the mobile operators, by the private sector companies? Yeah, that's general. one of the roles that the GSMA plays, and that's also why we, we leverage these country projects, not just to learn, but also to showcase what is the impact that can be achieved. Okay. What are the outcomes that can be achieved? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. And unless we solve that, unless we have that market demand, it's very difficult to then develop fit-for-purpose solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's very important for the mobile industry. So we're very experienced in developing solutions for consumers, understanding their needs, understanding the type of services they want. And so we need to build that same understanding and demand also from the governments and agencies that mm -hmm. want to deploy this. So you mean from both sides? And I asked Heather, this is something that you mentioned also, the, the, the awareness, no? the, the, the demand. What's the demand? What's the awareness? Um, yeah. 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 You want to expand on this, yes, Heather? I um, just to expand on that a little bit. So the, the issue that we have is if you look, look at the, the, where we are now with data and where we are with technology, you know, the, the, the cost of compute is, is minimal in comparison with where it was even five years ago. So we have cloud platforms automatically scalable. If you look across the statistical system where I'm focused, um, many of the um, less developed countries who need to, we need to bring up the curve can move straight to these new technologies if we help them move. So the issue of government understanding, I think, can only be driven by opening up the data and the technology and helping build capacity and capability within governments. So I think a lot of the work that the, public, the private sector is doing is extremely good. But, but we've got to work out how we make efficient private-public sector partnerships because we do not have enough capacity at the moment to identify, other than to seed this innovation, individual cases. And there's some great ones here. But if we really want to scale, we need to make these things generic and available so that if you have one or two data scientists, I can tell you, if they can have access to tools, technology, and data, they will achieve miracles from small numbers of people. And if they can learn from each other across the world, then we'll really start to get the value we need out of these data sources. Mm -hmm. And uh, one point that you mentioned before, Elena, was also the awareness of the richness of the data by the producer or the collector of that data. So in one hand, we have this awareness on the impact on the use of that data, but does it come along with the awareness of the richness inside the companies about that data? So I, I can speak uh, on about banks and specifically on, on my company, but, but what, I, what I see in, in the banking sector is that, of course, we are all aware that uh, data that we produce is, is key, is key for our business, and also it could be for many other things. The main barrier that I see is that uh, banks, especially the banks that uh, are the ones that have a lot of data, so are more traditional banks, are in the middle of their own digital transformation process. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that puts the priority in, okay, we have to do it for ourselves first, and then we'll see. No? And, and this means that, for instance, we are replacing data platforms, uh, we are struggling in getting the right skills and the right people and retain the people, 
it's not that easy to access our even our internal data. Is, I, I think this is the case also sometimes in telcos. It's not that easy to have a place where you have a few APIs so people can just connect because this is expensive. Mm -hmm. This needs skills. And you need to uh, uh, prioritize this before some things that are more, uh, you know, impacting your, your current business. So this is first, uh, I mean, we need to uh, be better at, at explaining the rest of the organization why this is something that we should be uh, doing, mm -hmm. no matter our, our current digital transformation. And in my experience also, it's interesting to see how when you do one of these projects, like for instance, what we did, what we did with cities, research that we did on cities, gave us ideas for products that we develop within the company. Mm -hmm. For instance, by analyzing payments data, we see that we can describe the city. So we, with these findings, we created a product that now we give uh, to retailers that buy a point of sale from us that describes the neighborhood and how they are doing compared to the competitors. Mm -hmm. So from an idea, uh, and I think this is interesting mm -hmm. because sometimes people say, look, look, you need a separated team. You need to put these people in another room so they do this stuff for good. Mm -hmm. And then we have the business guys. And I, I don't believe on that. I think it's, it's very rich to have people together. Of course, to dedicate the resources whenever there is a project, but to, to make the, this knowledge uh, you know, uh, move around the organization. Mm -hmm. And then privacy is also a huge in terms of in banking. You, you can imagine it's very regulated, not only externally, but also within the company. We have the, the compliance uh, areas. I mean, you don't, don't imagine the faces when first, the first time in six years ago I said, look, we're going to go and do this, uh, and we're going to share this data with the university. They were like, what? I mean, are you crazy? Because they are very conscious of the, uh, not only legal, but also the reputational damage of a data leak. Mm -hmm. so. so companies are going through their own digital transformation while doing big data for sustainable development projects are also discovering of new uh, uh, business uh, for the company. Janine, you want to complement to that? Yeah, I just wanted to link on two, two points mentioned here. So I think another key point to consider is that it's not so much about the data, it's about the insights. And that really requires those partnerships, one thing. It really requires partnerships with the users of that data or the end customer, whether that's a government or an agency, to really understand what are their needs, what insights are required, and therefore what models need to be developed, and then what data sets are input into that. So you really need to start from, from the insights. Um, and those models, those platforms, those technical capabilities requires uh, investment, resources to develop. Mm -hmm. uh, not just on the mobile industry side, but also on the demand side. We need the skills, we need the capabilities, and really need to have investment uh, in these areas. Um, which is why it's important to realize scale because that will drive that investment. Mm -hmm. um, and also really important uh, consideration in that is, um, uh, so linking on to the policy side, is that we develop very trusted approaches so that we really make sure that the data is from individuals, the privacy is respected and protected, and that we find those mechanisms to ensure that happens uh, in, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So we have investment needed by the private industry. So understanding the demand will also encourage that investment. And we go back, Heather, to the issue of collaboration and partnership. How do you see this balance between public and private sector collaboration and partnership and common interest? Well, I think it is a, it is a challenge. I mean, businesses are there to make money. We need businesses to make money so we can raise tax. And we need tax so that we can um, support uh, the people who need to be supported in our society. So there is a cycle here. I think what we have to do is to try and take a step back and, and look at you know, what is in the broad interest. So we, um, in the UK, we actually have the right now through legislation, we're extremely lucky, um, to actually um, take data from commercial organisations. So we have a legal right as the National Statistical Office to do this. Um, and our legislation is, is, is pretty advanced in that respect. Um, but what this means is, as you say, in order to actually make use of that data, you have to enter into a partnership, wh whether it be with telco providers, whether it be with financial institutions, which we do, and also with other government departments. So you do need to build those partnerships. And what you find when you build those partnerships is that it is of benefit to all parties to understand the data better. As soon as we, if you like, get our hands on this data and start to discuss how we might want to use it, we, because we're looking at the data through a different lens, 
we will actually identify all sorts of issues which are of benefit to the commercial partner. Issues of quality, um, issues of, of um, if you like, comparability between data sets because as statisticians we're looking at things across time. But there's a real challenge here for the future and the challenge for the future is the National Statistical Office needs to maintain records for hundreds of years. Now, I used to be in business, and I know that when you put data together in business, you're running a marketing campaign. You have a new product that you want to bring out. One, three years later, if you're, a, if you're a fast-moving business, you're not interested in keeping that data. Whereas for in the public interest, we, looked, we need to look at that data journey, including archiving that data so that it's available for future generations, because just having the result is not enough. There are, there are many institutional level frameworks we need to develop to actually make these partnerships effective in the longer term. And Heather, to continue on this, on this uh, what is it needed? What are the highlights, what would you say, for national statistics officers to adopt at larger scale uh, big data for official statistics? Well, first of all, finer grained, faster data, better insight. If you look at the way that the statistics offices operate historically, um, it's, it's, been, it's been going for hundreds of years. You go out, you do a survey, you think about the data you want, you bring that data in, and you, you calculate your statistic. And your statistic may be weekly, it may be monthly, and those are some of the faster grain ones. The, we live in an information age, so to be relevant, statistical offices need to provide information which is fine-grained and fast enough for the decision makers that we support. And that means, obviously, our governments, but also businesses and citizens. Mm -hmm. And Janine, um, mobile phone data has always been regarded as keen in the big data uh, universe, especially for official statistics. How do you foresee this collaboration with National Bureau of Statistics from the experience of what has happened until now? How do you foresee this, the future? And what do you propose in both sides to come together closer? Yeah. Yeah, because I see partnerships is, is really fundamental in that and to engage in those in the, in the longer term. Uh, and I think the, the reality is that that takes um, you know, uh, time from both uh, the government agencies and the mobile industry and other partners as well to really work together to understand better what is really needed, what are the real challenges that can be addressed with mobile big data and um, what are then the insights that can be generated uh, on top of that. I think also what's really important is that beyond those insights and what we've seen a lot is that you have a great pilot but then the results or the mechanisms are not created to really integrate that into the decision making. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that these insights are not just generated one off and then sit on the shelf but really mm. are integrated into those processes by the government so they help decision making. Mm. And I think that's a really key point where also we, we need to think longer term. So that's why partnerships are so important to think longer term, um, not just about you know the one-time evidence, but really how do you develop this on an ongoing basis? And, and that does require that ongoing investment that requires sustainable business model of financing on both sides. Mm. And investment in the skills and the capabilities on both sides to realize that in the long run. Mm -hmm. And Elena, so from your uh, views, what needs to be done to encourage more companies to follow the example of the BBVA and, and collaborate with also uh, National Bureau of Statistics to produce statistics from big data? Yeah, so I would say that there are like two big uh, blocks of, of things. One is the broader cultural uh, thing, both uh, in, the, in the organization that we would collaborate with and also internally for ourselves. Because I don't think that the level of understanding of what, what, what re this really means and the potential of the usage of this type of uh, new way of using data, um, you know, can unlock. I don't think people are aware of this. Uh, even in my company that we've done a lot of things, this, is, this has happened because a group of people really believed on this. Mm. And we've been fighting uh, internally, but I, I cannot say that this is something that is, you know, has permeated the whole organization, as well as uh, big data projects more in general in the, from a business perspective. So this is something that is pretty similar. Uh, we need people to understand what is the potential of data and also to understand how uh, these models work. Because, uh, for instance, internally, some people think that doing machine learning is just a way to plug data so it works. 
And this is not the same as the developing standard products because these new products learn from the environment and adapt. And that is, you know, you need to be more careful with that. So first is the, the cultural thing. Second, the priority thing. Again, both uh, in, the, in the public administrations and in the, in the companies. Uh, otherwise, we will do one-offs uh, forever. And one-offs that are, are based on people that fight to get this one-off. Um, so in order to get the priority, I think that we need to show that the impact uh, within the company, that the data donor, as I said before, is good in terms of uh, you know, um, creativity uh, for the teams. Also, it's, it's very interesting that the teams that work in this type of projects, this is great for a sense of belonging. So if you work in a company that dedicates some of the resources to this uh, type of projects, people feel very encouraged uh, by that, in my experience. Uh, yeah, and also uh, it's interesting to see the reputational impact. Uh, from a, a more selfish perspective, the, the, you know, the public communications impact of things that uh, have to do with this type of projects uh, has been huge compared to other initiatives that, that have been much more expensive, uh, at least in our case. So I think we have, finds, uh, we have to find these ways and, and we have the, the reasons to explain, but we need to do more. And it's been mentioned before, um, I would like us to touch on this point also, the issue of the regulatory frameworks, ethical issues, uh, data privacy. What are your views on this, Heather? Um, that's, a, that's a lot in that question. Um, I think the clear goal of increase, getting better value of data has, is about generating public value. So we've talked here about these examples, these pilots. You need to demonstrate value to the citizen. If we can demonstrate value to the citizen, also business, but primarily to individuals, then that will take us a long way in realizing the opportunity that we have ahead of us. If we don't demonstrate value to the citizen and ethical use of data, then we stand a chance of being tripped up by issues of privacy, how are you using my banking data? How are you using my phone data? So I think there's a, the, the, the bigger piece of thinking and the communication needs to be that these partnerships are using data in your interest as a member of the public, a member of society, to help us then ensure that we are given the right to continue to use this data in the public interest. That's equally important, the reputational side of this is equally important as actually the regulatory side, because you can have regulations, but if the citizen isn't happy with what you're doing with your data, we won't be able to make best use of it for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Janine, for those of us who have been doing this uh, work for years, we know that at the end of the day, when we need to sign with the private sector, that signing moment is quite complicated between the public and the private sector. You want to share with us our, your views on the way forward and this, how to unblock all those issues of signing and sharing data, reusing data? Yeah, that's something that we're you know, still puzzling on, um, is really to think through what can be done. Imagine a, a disaster scenario where you have um, a country being prone to earthquakes, hurricanes. Um, it's too late to start the discussion in the moment the disaster happens. Mm -hmm. And so we need to find a way to be prepared up front. Because once uh, the disaster strikes, of, of course, all the attention goes into the um, emergency response. And it's not the time to have the conversations about, can I use this data? How is it useful? Who needs to prove it? And, and who needs to sign that off? So one of the things we want to think through this year with our advisory panel and with our members is what steps could be taken to be ready ahead of time. So does that mean you need to start your dialogue earlier uh, and have an ongoing conversation to, to already set up some frameworks and principles um, to agree how that data will be used or rather the, how the insights will be created and then used, used by the government? Um, what policy and regulatory considerations need to be reflected in that? Um, what role will the individuals parties play, who will call the emergency, who does what. All these things need to be thought through in advance in reality. And again, that speaks to the point of, you know, this really requires longer term uh, investment and dialogue to establish those principles, because it's very hard to do that 
in the moment uh, and, and activate that in, in an emergency. Mm. And Elena, goes to your, so you mentioned in your, your brief uh, introduction the highlights, legal frameworks and regulatory frameworks being changed. You want to share with us about that? Yeah, well, as, as I mentioned before, the, the data privacy issues are, uh, this, is, this is key. And, and there are huge fears uh, within the industry for uh, legal compliance, but even more for uh, potential reputation damage, uh, because that could be huge. So, uh, yeah, so, so for instance, in my experience, when we have signed agreements with, uh, with other uh, institutions to collaborate or to share data, the most, most of the time has been, uh, you know, used to understand what data we are sharing, what can this data tell us. And I remember a few years ago, nobody were talking about the problem of uh, data unicity. So you could share granular data. And then a lot of uh, studies appear that, uh, saying that by linking that data source with another data source that could de-anonymize uh, you know, the, the original data. So when, when that happened, I remember all the lawyers in my company said, stop, stop everything you are doing. This is changing. Something is going on. So uh, my, my sense is that my feeling is that they are always a little bit behind. So they are scared of something that they don't know well. So setting standards for data sharing, setting even a kind of a, a stamp or certificate that says, look, this data set provided by whoever, telco or bank, is compliant with our United Nations standards. That could help us a lot uh, in these processes of data sharing. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. We are reaching the end of the panel discussion. So I'm just going to ask the panelists to give us a very brief takeaways. So to the question, what does it take to get to the next level in the use of big data for sustainable development? What do you want the audience to take away? OK, what it, the, the first thing it takes is collaboration and collaboration on projects which will move from pilot to scale. And in order to move from pilot to scale, they have to demonstrate value in the public interest. Thank you. Janine. I guess I have a, a flow of thoughts. Um, so yes, first is to, to raise more awareness and create market demand uh, and understanding, build the skills and capabilities in both the supply and demand side so that we can develop long-term partnerships to de deliver insights that can really be used, that are integrated in decision-making, that are actionable, that are supported by longer-term partnerships, investment roadmaps, and business plans. Um, and really in, all operating in a policy and regulatory environment that supports, enables, and incentivizes this data to be used. Mm, thank you. Elena? Yeah, so pretty similar. So first, awareness. And I think that with awareness, priority uh, will follow. And then if we have priority, then the money will follow, hopefully. Uh, and and more, more operatively, uh, and again, this is the same as what we are doing internally for the business uh, purposes. We need uh, data, we need skills, and we need good questions to be answered. Thank you. So you made it very easy for me to wrap up on this. We talk about collaboration. We talk about demonstrations. So the first, I would really say, we all agree that the starting point is to increase the demand and to demonstrate the value and the impact on this. So for many years, it's been proved at a small scale, but proving it at a large scale is needed also to increase that demand and then to facilitate all the rest of the process. So with this, we go back to Robert for final remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you to our amazing panelists. Um, thank you, Paula. So, in conclusion, a few thoughts on uh, ways forward, things that need to happen here. And we've heard really, really uh, good examples of this. I think just in sum, one area that tends to be neglected in these discussions that we've seen to date um, is around the need for public sector capacity building that hasn't been part of the conversation at the level that it needs to be. I mean, we're hearing all day long these discussions about robots taking away manufacturing jobs and so forth. But algorithms do the same thing, right? If you're a, a mid-career statistician in a Bureau of Statistics, you are reasonably asking yourself, do I need to learn machine learning in order to keep my job so my children can go to university, right? This is disruptive stuff. And we need to make sure that we're building the capacity um, for, for institutions to adopt these new capabilities at, at speed. Um, not only because we need these capabilities to achieve the sustainable development goals, um, but also because there is naturally the risk of backlash and resistance 
in adoption if we don't address the capacity gap. Um, you know, we, we really need the buy-in here uh, around, around the use of these technologies and to make sure that that capacity is there. Um, so, at any rate, I think we're seeing, we're seeing uh, you know, encouraging signs. We have uh, the GSM Association uh, with a working model of an industry-wide approach to using uh, big data for social good. Um, and now we're seeing through the leadership of BBVA, uh, mo the uh, financial services industry, banking, beginning to come in. Uh, we, we certainly hope uh, that what GSMA has been doing um, with their uh, you know, support across their membership in terms of partnerships uh, to implement projects together with an ethical code of conduct and the development of standards around data aggregation and anonymization, the beginnings of a model that could be applied elsewhere. Um, I think the uh, UK's data science campus on the Office of National Statistics is nothing short of astonishing. Um, this is really exciting. This is something we've been dreaming about for years, and it's happening, and they're taking on everything, including the culture clash, head on. Um, data scientists and statisticians don't always have the same personality type, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge, but uh, they're, they're taking it on um, head on and making it work. And I think we can begin to see a glimpse of the future we want, a world of open, real-time, um, and yet safe insights that could be used as the basis for new public services all over the world. Um, but there are a couple of elephants in the room that I did want to touch on, um, and they're the inevitable elephants of money and power. Now, when I talk about money, I mean public funding, and I mean private business models. And when I talk about power, I mean regulatory reform and political will. So uh, we talked about uh, you know, the, the need to invest in, in, uh, in public capacity. Another aspect of this is funding for innovation. In the early days, a lot of the funding for this kind of work came out of the various sectors, health, agriculture, food security, um, that a lot of the, uh, the innovation work uh, was being funded. And, and the challenge here is that uh, it's hard to use um, public impact money for innovation. In other words, you cannot use money that's meant to save lives for money that's meant to transform the entire underlying approach that we're using to try to get to a better way of saving lives in the first place. We need more funding that's actually allocated toward transformation around data in a way that's cross-cutting. Um, that's very, very important. And, and part of this the funding needs to be really focused on moving beyond the R&D work and getting to fewer but really compelling examples of impact at scale. There's no Google Maps for poverty today. There are five different kinds of big data you could use to produce such a thing. But until we see those really compelling examples at scale, we're not going to get all of the partners across this ecosystem that's forming to begin to engage um, at the level that they need to. The second issue of business models. We hear, for example, in, in the official statistics community, uh, there are often questions of whether we can get, you can get sustainable access to the data through regulation. And you can. You can force companies to share this data without you know, anything more than a penny or maybe just cost recovery. Um, but that's a terrible model for sustainable innovation. I think what we really are looking for is to see co companies all over the world competing to find better ways to produce tourism statistics and poverty statistics and health early warning systems and crisis response tools. Um, and that requires that there be a genuine business model underneath it. Um, you know, as Janine had noted, when you get to the natural disaster state, you can't come to a company and say, help, a bad thing has happened, quickly figure out all of the issues around regulatory issues, privacy, aggregation of the data set, how you can share it, and what we can do with it. It's too late. Um, but the, it's the humanitarian scenarios that cause everybody to think maybe we need to be, rebalance our regulations. What we need to do is to bring together the work that happens at the sort of statistical end and development end of the spectrum so that if, if, this, you know, if human mobility data is being used every day to, for better urban planning and, and monitoring exposure to pollution, then you already have in place the tools, the public trust, um, you know, the technology, the communications infrastructure, um, and the skill sets to use that data effectively so that when a bad thing happens, you can repurpose those networks and capacities to respond to a crisis. We've got to do both ends of the spectrum, humanitarian and development at the same time. Um, I think that 
you know, when we look at the regulatory space, um, you know, we talk to companies, and companies are willing to do this. Companies are excited about the idea. They see it, and you can see it on the stage here today. They see the opportunity, but they'll say, but there's no playbook. There's no regulatory playbook for safe and responsible use of this data, and that places us at reputational risk with our customers. This hasn't been blessed. It hasn't been authorized in a particular approach. So yes, we need standards around aggregation and anonymization, and ethical codes of conduct, moreover, in how we handle this data. You know, if you, if you look at the field of bioethics, which hand, um, involves people's well-being and data, it's an interesting analogy. The Hippocratic Oath begins with this principle of first do no harm. But first do no harm actually imposes two equal obligations on a physician. One, don't harm your patient. In other words, don't misuse the data in a way that could be harmful. But there's a second obligation, which is no less, which is take all reasonable steps to prevent all preventable harms from happening to the patient. And we're failing in this regard. We're failing because this data isn't being used today all around the world to improve public services. It isn't being used to help. A tiny, tiny fraction of it is. Um, and that's actually an ethical issue. The non-use of the data is, much, is arguably at least as much, if not more, of an issue than misuse of the data. Most privacy re-identification attacks are very hard to execute. But all, all over the world, there is suffering and death occurring because we aren't innovating and we aren't operationalizing these capacities. Um, we need to make sure that our privacy regulations address not only these risks of misuse, but also creates space for rapid, responsible innovation in the transformation of public services. Um, and that gets at my, my last uh, concern here um, in the area of power, which is around political will. The average person on the street has no idea of the data they produce, has no idea how it's being used, and has very little say in the matter. Um, increasingly, with the news cycle over the last year, people are aware that their data has been used for surveillance, um, that it has been used for helping companies make a profit, but they aren't aware of the opportunity costs they've been paying because the data wasn't used. And, you know, if we want regulations to change, there's going to have to be political pressure on leadership for people to stand up eventually and start talking about the fact that they, they see a need for their data to be used. Yes, protect us from misuse, but also we want to see accountability that the data can be used whenever it can be used safely. Um, so I, I think in conclusion, um, we're, we're very excited about this space. Um, I, we, we see the future just on the horizon here. Um, there's a lot of energy that certainly at the last World Data Forum in Cape Town wasn't in the room, and a lot of uh, organizations that are actually doing this for real, and it's exciting, and they're doing it at operational scale. Um, we're being asked to scale up our labs uh, in more countries around the world um, and start doing more of this work with our partners in, in different regions, uh, so we're very excited about that. I would love to work with any of you that would like to work with us in that regard. Um, finally, very grateful to our hosts, the United Arab Emirates, uh, for uh, the opportunity to speak with you today, um, and very grateful to our partners who are in the room with us as well. Thank you so much.